Hello, everybody, and um, it's a really great, great pleasure to welcome you all, wherever you are in the world, um, to our webinar. And um, I'm really excited to be able to introduce uh, Professor Julian Agerman, who will be speaking to us uh, about just sustainabilities in policy, planning, and practice. And just to give you an abstract to accompany uh, the talk, let me, let me tell you about what we will hear in a minute or two. In his talk, Julian will outline the concept of just sustainabilities as a response to the equity deficit in much sustainability thinking and practice. He will explore his contention that who can belong in our cities will ultimately determine what our cities can become. He will illustrate his ideas with examples from urban planning and design, food justice, and what he calls the Minneapolis paradox. And before I hand over to Julian to start off his talk, let me just tell you something about him. Professor Julian Agerman is Professor of Urban and Environmental Policy and Planning at Tufts University in the United States. He is the originator of the increasingly influential concept of just sustainabilities, the intentional integration of social justice and environmental sustainability. He centers his research on critical explorations of the complex and embedded relations between humans and the urban environment, whether mediated by governments or social movement organizations and their effects on public policy and planning processes and outcomes, particularly in relations to notions of justice and equity. He's the author of many books, uh, so authored and edited, including, and I think most notably, Just Sustainabilities, Development in an Equal World with MIT Press, Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class and Sustainability, also with MIT Press, and Sharing Cities, a case for truly smart and sustainable cities, again with MIT. One of nature's top 20 books in 2015, it's worth noting in terms of the latter. In 2018, he was awarded the Athena City Accolade by KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Or quote, his outstanding contribution to the field of social justice and ecological sustainability, environmental policy and planning. So in short, we really are, I think, incredibly fortunate to have Professor Julian Agerman talk to us about this topic. So Julian, thank you again. Uh, and the floor, so to say, is yours. Excuse me. Yes, thank you, Klaus, and thank you for RSA um, for inviting me to give this lecture at this um, seven o'clock hour in Boston. I just want to remind you of that, Klaus. It's not 12 o'clock everywhere. <laughs> um, OK, let me share my screen. Um, here we go. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can see that. Well, thank you. And thank you for, yeah, again, for inviting me to, to give this talk. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I've never spoken to this particular group and uh, I'm gonna learn more about it, I'm hoping over the um, uh, next hour, hour and a quarter. Um, before I start, I'd like to offer a land recognition. I'm speaking to you from my home in Cambridge, Massachusetts on the traditional territory of the Wampanoag and the Massachusetts people. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, their past, their present and their future and commit to a principle of respect and care as part of this meeting. So I want to unpack in the first 10 minutes or so this idea of just sustainabilities. Um, as Klaus mentioned, this was really the book that opened up the concept. And what we were concerned with was that this new concept of sustainability, and it certainly was new in the United States in the early 2000s, but really that had been launched in 87 through the Brundtland Report in 92 through the Rio Earth Summit, we were concerned about the equity deficit. Um, it's much less so now, thanks to some of the work that I do and a lot of other uh, great researchers around the world, but there really was an equity deficit. You picked up any book on sustainable development and it had one chapter on equity and social justice. Well, this book, equity and social justice, were themes that were carried through the book 
whether the chapter was on uh, mining in, in Colombia or whether it was on uh, deforestation in, in the Amazon or the Congo. Really, so the book then focused explicitly on equity and justice, on the links between environmental quality and human equality. And, you know, we were thinking to ourselves that really, if you look around the world where environmental degradation is happening, it's almost always, in fact, always happening in relation to human rights abuses and social injustices. And yet most of the literature really separated out environmental and social sustainability. What we were essentially arguing in this book was that sustainability can't simply be seen as a green or environmental concern, important though those are, but that a truly sustainable society would be one where wider issues, wider questions of social needs and social welfare were integrally related to economic opportunity and environmental limits uh, imposed by supporting ecosystems. I don't usually advertise other academics books, but I'm going to. Uh, this was, a, I think, a really important book in 2009, The Spirit Level, Why Equality is Better for Everyone by Wilkinson Pickett, pretty well known now. But let's pick through what they really said. The headline was, it's not poverty, it's inequality that's really damaging our societies. And they looked at societies across the world, 40 years of comparable data, and they really found that as inequality grows, social problems grow from incarceration to high school failures to teen pregnancies, you name it. The whole gamut of social malaises grows as inequality grows. But they also noticed that there was something else going on, that those countries with the biggest gap between rich and poor also had the highest advertising revenues. Advertisers love inequality. Inequality sells stuff very quickly at all levels in society, not just the poor trying to get into the middle class, but the rich getting into the super rich. So they came up with this idea of competitive consumption and competitive consumption is greater in societies with greater inequality. But from our point of view and from the Glasgow COP26 point of view, frankly, competitive consumption heightens our carbon footprint. So they also made, I think, a really important point that inequality grows our carbon footprint. How much do we talk about inequality as a driver of climate change? It's an upstream solution, but we're always focusing on downstream solutions like, oh, sustainable agriculture, sustainable transportation, important. But let's look at some of the drivers. And clearly one that was identified by Wilkinson and Pickett is inequality as a driver of our carbon footprints through this competitive consumption process. So my argument here really is if we want to understand sustainability, just sustainability, we need to look at issues of equity and environmental quality together, not as separates as most social movements uh, do. So how am I defining just sustainability? Well, it's the need to ensure a better quality of life for all now and into the future in a just and equitable manner while living within the limits of supporting ecosystems. And inherent in this, there are four conditions. We must commit to improving people's quality of life and well-being. We must commit to both inter and intragenerational equity. We must commit to justice in terms of recognition, process, procedure and outcome. Much of the early work on environmental justice was about procedural justice, about let's get the processes right by which people can have a, an input to policy and planning processes. I want you to think again of a more upstream notion of justice, and that is recognition, the simple recognition of the rights to be of certain groups. And we have no stronger cry for recognition at the moment than the Black Lives Matter movement, Me Too movement, the um, cries for indigenous recognition and rights. If we don't recognize the right to be of certain groups in society, how can we ever do justice by them? How can we ever embark on reconciliation or even reparation and restorative justice processes. One, two and three must be done within ecosystem limits. So don't think of just sustainability as simply some kind of social justice formulation. It is, but it is cognizant of the greater need to live and undertake our human enterprise in a more just and equitable way while living within uh, ecosystem limits. Little plug at for myself, I want to say, and I, I greatly admire Kate Raworth's work on the donor economics. 
but just sustainability underlies and predates both donor economics and the sustainable development goals. In fact, Kate and I have talked and Really, if you look at her uh, donut diagram here with its ecological ceiling and its social foundation, that safe and just space for humanities is just sustainability. The idea that we must live within limits, but we mustn't let people fall below this social foundation. As Klaus mentioned, I'm now a professor in urban planning, and I want to give three thoughts about urban planning that are gonna inform my examples that I'm gonna give you in a few minutes. One of the simplest definitions of urban planning by Patsy Healy, Emeritus Professor from Newcastle University in the UK, is urban planning is managing our coexistence in shared space. Wonderfully simple. Managing our coexistence in shared space. Whether we're talking about environmental transport, housing or other urban environmental conflicts, what we have to think about is how do we manage coexistence or celebrate coexistence in shared space? And it's even more complicated because we are living in what people call cities of difference, places where we are in the presence of the other. How do we coexist in shared space with people who are different to us, who are of different religions, different um, skin colors and phenotypes, different sexual orientations? We're increasingly in places of different identities and multiple identities. How do we coexist in shared space in that context? Very importantly as well, I'm really sort of working on this at the moment, um, this idea about belonging and becoming. One of the great things about urban planning, and you think about the great urban planners of the past, they were all visionaries. We're always dreaming about what our cities, our places, our spaces can become. But what we're not so good at is who gets to belong in those places and spaces that we are dreaming about changing. Are we as urban planners as good at fostering belonging through recognition, reconciliation, difference, diversity, inclusion, as we are at developing prescriptions for what our cities can become? And I would say, no, we're not as good. We need a much better balance between belonging and becoming because ultimately who gets to belong in our cities will determine what our cities become. We don't want them to just become elite spaces. And I'm gonna obviously talk about uh, the processes of disbelonging, uh, as I see them, and uh, especially from the United States perspective. I also want to just say that there's a big move in the US through people like the Congress for New Urbanism to talk about human scaled planning. And that's fine, but I want you to put a, the letter E on the word human. I want humane scaled planning. I want planning for human dignity. I want planning that is empathetic, planning that helps people feel that they do belong uh, in uh, whatever space or jurisdiction. So I'm going to give three examples um, through the idea of spatial justice. How do we allocate rights in urban spaces and places? I'm going to talk, as Klaus said, about the Minneapolis paradox. How is it that one of the most green liberal cities in the US is now the epicenter of our current introspection over structural racism? And then I want to talk a little bit about food justice. What is local food in intercultural societies? Who gets to say what local food is or should be? So let's start off with spatial justice. So great quote by David Lamy, I think absolutely visionary quote. <clears throat> justice, social justice requires that life chances are not distributed along class lines. Spatial justice requires that they are not distributed geographically. And we can see here the wall in Jerusalem. Uh, we have walls in Nicosia, we had uh, a wall uh, barricades in Belfast. We do have crude ways of separating, but in the US, it's a little more subtle. Um, there can be a railway track, uh, a creek or a river, a freeway, and on one side they live and on one side you live, and their life chances are not as good as yours. In fact, a recent Harvard uh, University public health um, study really concluded that your zip code is more important than your genetic code in determining your lifespan and your life opportunities in the United States. That's how segregated uh, our societies are. And of course, one of the greatest tools that geography has given to the world since the map is a GIS. And in many ways, GIS is the perfect way of uh, measuring and looking at and visualizing spatial injustices and inequities. <clears throat> 
But let me bring this down to the level of the street, the public space that we use every single day. And here's two public spaces, two streets, on the right, Massachusetts Avenue in Cambridge, near where I live, and on the left, Sodrevegen in Gothenburg, Sweden. Both identical width, but they couldn't be more differentiated spatially. On the left, the Swedes have imposed spatial ordering. They have democratized the street. The only part of the street that is open to private vehicles is to the left of the streetcar where you can see the, the uh, barrier. On Massachusetts Avenue, not so much. Um, this really shows that in the US, your access to public space, in this case the street, is determined by A, having a vehicle, and B, how big that vehicle is. I want you to think about that street. Look at the apartments. Kids are coming out every day going to school. How are the kids wired differently according to which street they're on? I don't know of any research to show the psychological effects. I mean, we, we know about the public health, the lead loadings, and pollution and stuff like that. But what about the psychological effects of basically organized chaos on the US street versus spatial ordering on the uh, Swedish street? Now, of course, we have data at Don Appleyard's great work in the 70s and 80s. We know that street traffic affects social interaction. The street on the right, is lightly trafficked and people have more acquaintances and more friendships across the street than the heavily trafficked street. What's the just sustainability's take on this? Well, in the US, certainly, the uh, streets with the heaviest traffic are ones in lower income and minority neighborhoods. And the streets with light traffic, the so-called complete streets, livable streets, are much more characteristic of wealthier neighbourhoods. So we can see here that there is a spatial injustice in, in many ways in opportunities to socially interact across these public spaces we call streets. Now, it's not all bad news from the US. Um, under the Bloomberg administration, orchestrated by um, the brilliant Transportation Commissioner uh, Janet Sadiq Khan, who brought in Jan Gale from Copenhagen and enlisted then the whole range of transportation justice, uh, street and mobility justice advocates. And here, here's what we have today on the bottom right. Um, we have Macy's on Broadway, and this is a people street. The US can do this. It just requires political leadership and vision and bringing along those social movement organizations with you. But there's another point I want you to think about when you look at this slide. Planning must be about what is possible. We, if we keep working the tired old paradigm, oh, we've never done that before, we're never going to, we're never going to get anywhere. Good urban planning, good urban sustainability practice happens when we think about what is possible, not what is probable. But as I said, we're very good at disbelonging people, at othering them, at making them uh, insignificant and invisibilizing them through the hostile and defensive architecture notion, whether it's teenagers, top left, um, being prevented from um, getting on their edges on their skateboards, whether it's uh, putting um, armrests on benches to stop homeless people sleeping on them, even more egregiously, it's putting studs, architects designing buildings with studs to stop homeless people sleeping there. You know how at stations we put spikes to stop pigeons? What's the difference between these studs and those spikes? This is inhumane planning. Uh, when I was calling earlier for you know, this idea of humane scale planning, this is precisely what I'm talking about. The rich doors, poor doors scandal, <clears throat> US, UK, all around the world where uh, cities require developers to put uh, affordable units in large new condo developments. Some cynical architects and developers are requesting poor doors round the back so that the rich can come in from the boulevard, have their cars valet parked, whisk up to the penthouse suites. Rich doors and poor doors, exclusion, non-belonging, disbelonging. Probably even more cynical is bottom left, a, um, an overpass, a railway overpass in Seattle. And you'll notice bike racks under there. So there was a homeless encampment and the city decided, how can we get rid of this? Yes, let's use sustainability. Let's use cycle infrastructure. Let's put cycle racks there that will move the homeless people on. Luckily, the good cycling community of Seattle said, not on our watch, this isn't going to happen. Um, we have a problem, Seattle, 
we need to deal with it with resources, with, uh, with policy, not through the use of sustainability architecture as defensive architecture. Very timely at the moment in the US, um, we have the infrastructure bill passed or the physical infrastructure part of the bill. And one thing that's really interesting is that there is um, a pot of money for what's called reconnecting communities, highway removal, if you like. Removing urban highways can improve neighborhoods blighted by decades of racist policies. We've coined a new term for this. This is racist infrastructure. One of my students said, but Julian, how can a road be racist? Well, the road isn't racist, but where the road goes can be driven by white supremacist and racist values. And for any city in the US, you can do a, a GIS overlay of low income neighborhoods and where the freeways are. And there's a pretty, pretty strong correlation. So in the 50s and 60s, roads were driven through black low income minority neighborhoods to segregate and separate. One very interesting concept, I think, is from my friend Elijah Anderson at Yale. Elijah is a sociologist. And he, his argument is, look, most of the time we walk down streets and we are just focused on not making eye contact with anybody. But that there are certain places in cities, and he calls them cosmopolitan canopies, where we sit down, we eat, we watch a ball game, we talk to people, we are civil. Cosmopolitan canopies, and this, his classic example is the Philadelphia's Reading Terminal Market. Markets, food spaces are very good as cosmopolitan canopies. So one of my questions to my students and one of my questions to you, is there a role for us as planners, urban designers, in creating or at least creating the conditions where cosmopolitan canopies can occur? Kids' spaces are very good for cosmopolitan canopies. The kids play, parents and guardians talk. Dog parks are very good. I learned that as a new dog owner. Great space because you have a focus that is not you. It's the dog, it's the kid, it's the food. Cosmopolitan canopies, spaces where we can engage across difference. And this invokes, I think, contact theory, the idea that the more contact you have with people who are different from you, the more likely you are to be supportive, tolerant, even wanting policies that uh, bring people together across difference more. Is the cosmopolitan canopy concept or contact theory going to stop racism? No, not at all. But it begins conversations that I think form a grounding such that we can begin to talk about some of the more difficult issues. There's a big move in the US for complete streets, and I'm sure there is in the UK. I don't know what it's called. Maybe it's livable streets. But here's some design manuals. Every town and city in the US, Canada, has complete streets design manuals. And we would agree with this. We want green streets. We want sustainable neighborhoods. But is this merely going to reinscribe the separation of rich and poor neighborhoods? Is it going to result in enhanced livability for only the most privileged residents of cities? Now, let's think about what a complete street is. And I want to invoke here the, the late great Doreen Massey, who sees places, and following my arguments, I see streets as places, as having no meaning, rather they are constantly shifting articulations of social relations through time. Streets are social ecologies. They are social ecological processes that change through time. But most urban designers who um, do complete streets projects are physical designers. They do not understand the anthropology and the sociology of the street. It's much more about the physicality of the street. And you can see an urban design here on the right. And then on the left, there's a street in Athens. You can't plan for that street. That street has happened as a result of human endeavor. Yes, the physical spacing of the buildings is controlled by building codes. But what's happening on that street is precisely what Massey is talking about, social relations which will shift through time. Los Angeles, would you believe, the, one of the motor capitals of the US has a very strong complete streets policy. Only problem is it banned until very recently one of the most exuberant forms of street theater, which is street food vending. Now, in a metropolis where the two key minority groups are Southeast Asian and Latinx, whose cultures are predicated around street food and socialization, 
how can you say you have a street, complete streets policy when you ban one of the most culturally significant street events that many cultures uh, share in? Now, recently, uh, LA has started permitting uh, street, street vending, but it's a little bit late, a little bit late. And it was also for the wrong reason. They only uh, started permitting um, street vending when uh, Trump got into power because they were worried that street vendors would be visible to the immigration authorities and that they would be checking on their on their permits. Now let's go a little bit further with this idea of complete streets. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, in a few minutes about redlining, the practice in the US where certain neighborhoods, black, low income, minority, were redlined literally on a map and denied federal or private sector funding. There's now a concept coming up called greenlining, um, where these complete streets programs are coalescing in certain areas, certain places of cities, and that these greenlined neighborhoods have a price premium. The rents go up, the house prices go up. It's gentrification. And for some of you, you might know of my book series, uh, which is called the uh, Routledge Equity Justice and the Sustainable City series. And my book is Incomplete Streets. And again, I problematize this idea of the complete street. I'm not against it, but I just wanna know who gets to say what is a complete street? How do social relations weave into the physicality of the complete street design? And the book on the right is, um, I think, really interesting because it talks about green gentrification and how in the US, greening neighborhoods whitens neighborhoods. So redlining, explicitly racist, greenlining, not racist, but predicated on sustainability and socioeconomic factors. But the physical, sorry, the visible uh, evidence is that greenlining has a similar effect. It is segregationist in that it segregates by ability to pay. So one of the arguments really coming out of this series is that we are systematically reproducing many of the urban, spatial and social inequalities and injustices that have characterized US cities by doing something good, which is making complete streets. Now, we'll, we'll obviously we're going to talk about this a lot more. Now, I'll go further. I would say uh, if we are looking for a, one of maybe five top urban sustainability metrics, I think we would agree walkability would be in that mix. Walkability, the ability um, of the urban environment to support walking. And there's an app, of course, to measure this. It's called WalkScore. Who owns that app? Well, it's Redfin, which is a online realty giant here in North America. Let's just think. The key metric for urban sustainability, walkability, is measured through an app that is owned by a real estate company. We have commodified and compromised sustainability in the US, such that it is now about, as in every other case in the US, the ability to pay. Think about urban parks. Um, I think urban parks are another very good example of urban spaces that we use, um, probably more frequently now since the uh, COVID uh, epidemic. But, in this book, Rethinking Urban Parks, Public Space and Cultural Diversity, not biodiversity, but cultural diversity. In this book, they argue that our lack of, or our threats to public space are not through lack of use, but the ways we design, manage, and I would also include program public space. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more uh, later about this idea that I have of what I would call co-production of public space. How do we co-produce spaces? Couldn't we co-design, co-manage and co-program parks? Wouldn't that be a better use of public space? Wouldn't that make people feel that they belonged because they felt they had a stake in that space? Now, let me come over to Boston. Um, I have to say, very exciting times in Boston. We've just elected our first mayor, uh, of uh, first female mayor, first mayor of color. And she's a 36 year old Taiwanese American. And I'm privileged and honored to have been invited to serve on her transition team. But this slide speaks to, I think, a big problem that we have in US cities. We have, and we do in the UK, as far as I can remember, we have a lot of these friends of organizations, friends of the park, friends of the Esplanade, friends of the harbor. Who are the people on, in those organizations? They're usually well-established, moneyed, uh, networked kind of people. 
what happens when the leadership of a city becomes um, the leadership of the dominant groups now in Boston, majority minority city. The city of Boston doesn't look like these Friends of the Park organizations, yet they have an inordinate say in what our public spaces look like. How do we reconcile that? And this is part of a great report, and I can supply it to anybody by Lanfer and Taylor, called Immigrant Engagement in Public Open Space Strategies for the New Boston. How do we accommodate newcomers in public spaces that are largely envisioned and controlled by people like Olmsted, and then his successors, the Friends of the Park organizations? Very interesting tension. But some immigrants are doing it themselves, in a sense. They are inventing their own ways to belong. A Guatemalan American in Boston said, I think one of the reasons that that place is so popular with us Latinos is because of the willows. Willows in Guatemala are very common. They grow beside rivers. People like Herta Park because it looks like home. Hold that idea, this idea of transferring your home to where you now belong, gravitating towards familiar plants, landscapes, I call this landscape links. In Copenhagen, uh, if any of you have visited uh, the Norrborough district, a very large immigrant district in Copenhagen, there is a, an amazing place called Superkeelan Park where the designers have tried to design in encounter. They've tried to design in contact theory, design in engagement through using artifacts from different cultures to illustrate a statement of presence. And you can see here, this linear park has different zones and there are artifacts from all the different cultures represented uh, in the neighborhood. So a different way, the Guatemalan in Boston was voting with his feet. Here we are designing in encounter. I gotta give a big shout out to my good friends at the University of Sheffield, the Department of Landscape, who formed the Transnational Urban Outdoors Research Group. Um, they have really convinced me and they are doing great work. As urban planners, we use demographic data a lot, too much, I think, in many ways. So that the average urban planner knows about a neighborhood is the percentages of different groups, racial, ethnic, etc. We need to drill down. We need deep ethnographies of our neighborhoods, not simply demographic data. And I think the idea of engagement and belonging will be enhanced through deep ethnographic understanding. And there's an excellent article in my journal, Local Environment, the International Journal of Justice and Sustainability, that was written by the, uh, the chief uh, person that I know in that group, uh, Claire Rishbeth, and I wanna give a shout out to Claire. Ethnographic understandings of ethnically diverse neighborhoods to inform urban design practice. This kind of work needs to happen more. We need to have our urban design informed by ethnically um, deep ethnographies. We need to understand that much more. And again, there's an opportunity here for co-production. How about urban planners working with local communities to develop community histories, community deep ethnographies? Uh, they're doing other work on refugees and uh, asylum seekers, people who've been traumatized. What are the public space needs? What are the well-being needs as regards public space for those groups? So deep ethnographic information, I think, is essential. I now want to shift to the Minneapolis paradox. And I really want to uh, put out the contention I have that urban planning in the US is a tool of white supremacy and we can do something about it. So this is the other lesson of Minneapolis. Now, on all the green environmental sustainability factors, uh, Minneapolis is up there with Portland, Oregon, and uh, other cities that are uh, moving towards greening. It's got the best park system in the U.S. Uh, and has had uh, it. Excuse me, has had it for about the last ten years. Uh, Minneapolis is one of the best cities in the U.S. for exercise with trim tracks, and running spaces. It's got the third most bike commuters. It's affordable. It's it, it, it's clean. It's green. If you're white. But if you're not, Minneapolis is among the worst in the nation at racial inequality and equity. First, the black-white income gap is one of the highest in the nation, what people are paid for their jobs. More significantly, though, the black-white home ownership gap is about the highest in the nation. This is the wealth gap. 
the cascading wealth gap. And just to give you an example from Boston, the average wealth, um, net wealth of the average African-American family is $8. The average wealth of the average white family in Boston is $247,000. Just let that sink in. This is what we're talking about with the inequality of wealth in the United States. In Minnesota, generally, the state of Minnesota, the uh, K through 12, up to 12th grade, um, racial achievement gap, the opportunity gap, as, as, as many of us would call it, is huge between white and black and white and Native Americans. So why? Why is this? Why is Minneapolis, this green progressive city, so divided racially? Kirsten Delagarde, who is um, the head of a fantastic project I urge you to go called Mapping Prejudice, Kirsten says all that civic rhetoric about Minneapolis being a model metropolis at the cutting edge of great urban planning obscures darker truths about the city. So I wanted to know what are these darker truths? In the up to about 1900, Minneapolis had a small but very well dispersed African American population. And then something happened in 1910, precisely 1910 in Minneapolis, we got racialized covenants. This home should not be let or otherwise sold to anybody other than the Caucasian race. No, Negroid, Mongoloid, um, Turkish. The, I mean, the, the specificity of different racial and ethnic groups was absolutely fascinating. I do urge you to go and take a look at it. So we got the covenants. By 1930, 20 years after the first covenants, we can see the development of North Minneapolis which is the uh, now still the largely minority and black uh, neighborhood of Minneapolis. So racialized covenants started the process. In 1917, the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court struck down racialized zoning. Baltimore had been one of the first cities to use race for zoning. Remember where zoning came from? It came from the cholera epidemic in London. It came from Chadwick's recommendations about separating out land use as well. In true American style, if you're going to separate out land uses, why not separate out people? So racialized zoning was legal until 1917. And then after 1917, cities were scrambling. Well, if we can't segregate on the basis of race, what are we going to do? Let's build big single family homes that are only affordable to the wealthy. And you'll find in many, many, many US cities now, 70% of residential land, and even more in certain cities, is single family zone. What does that say about belonging? It says we don't want poor people, and we know that among those poor people are people of color. So that was the second kind of thing. And then we had redlining where, um, as I mentioned, certain neighborhoods were earmarked for no investment. And this redlining uh, was made illegal, but it, it carried on. And the, the crises of the 60s and 70s and into the 80s uh, of neighborhoods that were completely disinvested, almost looked like a bomb had been dropped in certain neighborhoods. You could look at them in Philadelphia, in New York, uh, and in, in, in places like Minneapolis. Now, the result of all of this is racial segregation then and now. But I just want you to think as well about each one of these racialized covenants, single family zoning, redlining, in itself would be effective as segregation think about the cumulative effects of these three processes and the synergistic effects of these processes. Only one country did it better than the US, and that was apartheid South Africa with the Group Areas Act, where you actually had to produce pass papers to get from one um, group area to another. Heather Worthington, the Director of Long Range Planning, acknowledges, as the city does, that there's a direct linkage between those practices in the late 20, uh, sorry, in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century and today's modern zoning plans, and that the city is pledged to do something about it. If there's one quote that I want you to go away with, this is a piece that I wrote in the conversation recently, urban planning is the spatial toolkit for articulating, implementing, and maintaining white supremacy, and we can do something about it. And I just want to stop on this word white supremacy. Five or 10 years ago in the United States, we would be huddled in a bar whispering the word white supremacy. It was like a cabal, you know, white supremacy. Now it's out there along with racist infrastructure. The good thing about the US is 
we can talk about these issues, I think more than say the Canadians, and I think more than the Brits can as well. I think we, we can talk about these issues because they are so palpable in uh, urban outcomes that, that even Fox News, maybe it's not a constructive conversation about white supremacy on Fox News, but at least they are saying these words, white supremacy. So one of the ways that Minneapolis is looking to change is through the Minneapolis 2040 plan. Prior to that in 2018, they were the first US city to remove um, single family zoning and allow duplexes and triplexes on previously single family zoned land. And they've um, done what's called inclusionary zoning, the idea that, that um, the new developments above a certain number of units have to have a minimum of 10% units for moderate to low income families. But I want you to focus on goal number one, eliminate disparities. In 2040, Minneapolis will see all communities fully thrive, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, country of origin, religion, or zip code, having eliminated deep-rooted disparities in wealth, opportunity, housing, safety, and health. There are 39 policies attendant to this goal of eliminating disparities. I've just highlighted a few here, environmental justice and green zones, park design and programming. Again, this point about how do we change the way people interact in parks? Let's get people involved in the design, uh, programming and management of parks. Freeway remediation, taking off the freeways. But I just, I do caution here. What are we gonna replace the freeway with? If we put parks in there, we know that green amenities can lead to gentrification. What we put in place of these removed freeways is going to be very important. And my um, take from the research is that we need housing stabilization and affordability policies in place before the freeway is removed. If it's done afterwards, when the park is there or the green space is there, it's too late. Gentrification has already taken place. But I do urge you, if you're interested, take a look at the Minneapolis 2040 plan as an example of what progressive um, democratic cities in the US are doing. So I want to finish up in the next five, ten minutes with some thoughts on um, on, on food and food justice. And the situation is, is different in the US, but I, I want you to think about uh, some of the things I'm saying. A book opportunity here, um, Klaus mentioned my book, Cultivating Food Justice, Race, Class and Sustainability. 10 years old now, it's the standard uh, book on food justice really at um, undergraduate and graduate levels here in the US and MIT Press, I'm happy to say, have just begging us to come up with a second edition. So anybody going to the AAG in New York, uh, in February, we are having six sessions of hopefuls who want to put their get their chapter into Cultivating Food Justice 2.0. So I want to tell a little bit of a story by way of introduction of this question, what are local foods in intercultural society? Now, here in the US, we have um, you know, a very powerful alternative food movement, very powerful. And their two main foci are local, localism, buy fresh, buy local, and farmers markets. From the farmers market is the, the economic locus of this movement. Here's George and Julia Bowling. They're two farmers in Maryland and the state of Maryland is trying to get farmers away from tobacco farming and into other products. So George and Julia being good entrepreneurs are thinking, what are, what are we gonna grow? And they suddenly realize there's 150,000 Africans in Washington DC mostly middle and upper middle class, diplomats, professors, surgeons, policymakers, etc. They want to eat fresh, locally grown African food. So George and Julia got thinking about this. They contacted the extension service of the University of Maryland and entered into a kind of research project. What African foods could we grow in the Maryland climate and soil? And it turns out a lot. So they developed a, a manual along with the African community. And now the uh, signboard to the bowling farm, a former tobacco farm, it says African produce. What are local foods? If the Africans want African food grown in Maryland, is that local? Many of you are geographers out there. We know there is no such thing, fixed thing such as local. It's a relational notion that we might agree on uh, based on whatever criteria we come up with. But clearly 
the immigrants are not feeling it as regards what the alternative food movement says is local. This is local food, buy fresh, buy local. And all the pictures are of, you know, European type foods. Whereas the Africans want African food. The Filipinos in San Diego, when asked what is local food, they say, well, it's our food. We grow it in our backyards and we eat it in our restaurants. I think we need to invoke this notion of translocalism. Immigrants bring with them their own local, whether it's the Guatemalan sitting under the willows on the banks of the River Charles in Boston, whether it's the Africans who want to drive out to Maryland to go and pick uh, African foods and then take them back, whether it's the Filipinos in San Diego, or whether it's the Chinese Canadian farmers who make up up to 20% of farmers in the greater Vancouver region of Canada. The Chinese Canadian farmers, and you can see one of the farms here, very interestingly for urban planners, you can see a, a very typical multi-generational home that is causing all kinds of problems amongst planners uh, who, you know, have certain codes and um, they don't like to see these multi-generational homes, uh, especially in uh, large urban areas. But that's a, that's a whole nother lecture. But because of this history of anti-Chinese racism in Canada and the Chinese entrepreneurial spirit, the Chinese Canadian farmers, they don't use farmers markets. They created their own. So there's roadside markets, there's Chinese farmers markets. And interestingly, I gave this lecture in Vancouver 10 years ago and a young East African woman came up to me and she said, Julian, thanks so much for this. I go and shop at the Chinese farmers markets because they grow the food that I want to eat. I'm just problematizing here this, this notion of what is local? What is a farmers market? Who gets to say what these, uh, what these places and spaces are? In 2006, a uh, great tragedy, the um, South Central Farm in LA, the biggest urban farm in the US was destroyed and it was 95% Latinx, 95% of the farmers, like these two women here from Oaxaca in Mexico. And what you can see there um, is a line of prickly pear cactuses behind the women, traditionally used as field boundaries in, in Oaxaca and, and much of Central America as well. And then you can see the, um, the wire fence, which is obviously a more traditional um, way of separating out spaces uh, in, in North America. But what's really interesting about these women is not only are they growing culturally appropriate foods, but they are growing it in a way that is relevant of their garden back home. And their quote, I think, is just it's moving to me. I planted this garden because it's a little space like home. We grow the same plants that I had back in my garden in Oaxaca. We can eat like we ate at home, and this makes us feel like ourselves. It allows us to keep a part of who we are after coming to the United States. Food is the umbilical link between where you're from and where you are now. Never underestimate. Food is not just a collection of chemicals, a physiological necessity. Food, food ways are absolutely important to immigrant groups, especially in these times of greater xenophobia. And Again, that's a whole nother research interest of mine. I would love to go into more detail, but I, I simply don't have time at the moment. We also have um, about 50 farms across the United States dedicated to what's been called refugee agriculture. Uh, refugees, asylum seekers, people who want to get a first footing into US agriculture, like the Scandinavians and the Germans and the Dutch did 200 years ago. These farmers are more likely to be from East Africa, from Southeast Asia, from Eastern Europe. And these farms are growing around San Diego, or Minneapolis, Phoenix. We have one here in the Boston metro area that is uh, co-run by a nonprofit and by my university, Tufts University's Friedman School of Nutrition, Science and Policy. Just a couple of um, closing thoughts. Um, if you're interested, my latest book is The Immigrant Food Nexus, Borders, Labour and Identity in North America. This idea of uh, immigrants and food, immigration and food, let's not forget that about 70% of workers in the food chain from fields to restaurants in the US are immigrants, uh, many of whom are undocumented. Let that sink in. Food and immigration are intimately intertwined uh, in, in the US. And at both national policy level and at local policy level, 
that needs to really be uh, acknowledged. Finally, I, again, I want to um, just call out the uh, monumental change that's happened in Boston and to Mayor-elect Michelle Wu, who has produced what I consider to be second only to the Belo Horizonte in Brazil uh, food security strategy. She has, uh, as a policy proposal, a food justice agenda for a resilient Boston. Several points I want to make. Food justice means racial justice, demanding a clear-eyed understanding of how white supremacy has shaped our food systems. See these words? Food justice, racial justice, white supremacy shapes our food systems. Starting at that analysis and that understanding, you can then build uh, an anti-racist food system. Most food plans that I look at, whether it's Toronto, Seattle, Austin, Texas, kind of wishy-washy around issues of equity. None of them mention social justice virtually. Equity and equality. But her plan nails it. And it also talks about worker rights in, um, in, in, in restaurants. So it's got an expansive notion of food justice, and it's, I think, um, going to be enacted upon in terms of uh, developing much more sustainable food systems and much more racially just food systems uh, here in the Boston metro area. So let me summarize. Um, we need to think about urban planning, as managing our coexistence, celebrating our coexistence in shared space. We need to think about how we can foster belonging by starting with recognition of difference, diversity and inclusion, and continuing to think about what cities can become, but remember, they can only become as good as who gets to belong. We need to foster engagement and belonging using deep ethnographies. Let's co-produce deep ethnographies with communities so that we understand the depth of communities, not just the, um, the statistics about presence, i.e. demographic statistics. Let's engage in intercultural, culturally competent policy and planning. Let's have an element of cultural humility. Let's practice humane scaled and human scaled urban planning and design. And I'll leave you with the final thought. Above all, social justice never simply happens. I mean, I've been in this policy game for a long time. And, you know, when you look at it, economic, technical, uh, environmental goals are often in the mix. And then if we enhance equity and social justice in the process, then that's a good thing. But equity and social justice are very much seen as second order uh, goals. We need to recenter equity and social justice because Social justice never simply happens. And this is why I'm so excited about Mayor-elect Wu's policies. They center social justice and equity. Final point, we don't get to social justice and equity. We start with social justice and equity in our policy making processes. Thank you. Julian, thank you ever so much for a, a truly, truly engaging. Uh, and I have to say, really wonderful lecture. I think you you just have an immense skill, if I may say so, to cover so many things and yet to also produce an utterly compelling narrative as well. Um, so thank you so much. We've got a couple of questions already, so I'm not going to do chair's privilege. I'm going to hand over straight to the, the audience questions and I'm just going to read them out for you. So let me take the first one I've got. Um, it's, a, it's a paragraph, so just bear with me as I read it to you, but it does provide some nice context. So, this week, Manchester, in the northwest of the UK, um, held its own version uh, around COP26. The event was skewed heavily towards economic growth and technocratic problem solving. You could also clearly see that attendees were mostly representing interests of local businesses rather than local communities. Can we really move away from the reproduction of the systematically embedded inequality without addressing the issues with procedural injustice? Is it possible to address the real needs of people who lack their own voice during such events and conferences? Most importantly, why should the marginalized communities care if there is a number of more pressing issues than sustainability? So I appreciate there's quite a lot in that question. Um, and. I'll, I'll simply open to you as, to respond as, as you see fit. That's our first question. So let me take the last, you know, can we expect poorer communities to care when there are more pressing issues than sustainability? Well, as I've framed it, sustainability is about all of those issues, housing, 
access to green spaces. It's about all of those things. So I think the, the questioner is asking it as if sustainability is about the icing on the cake. Well, I don't see sustainability as the icing on the cake. I see just sustainabilities as being about precisely what the questioner is asking, about how we can um, co-create, co-produce environments that are just, resilient and sustainable and that the issues that are included within sustainability include access, mobility justice, access to housing. I mean, you know, we've got a lot of uh, abundant evidence in the US that, for instance, good public transit enhances people's ability to uh, have maximum housing choice, especially people on low incomes, um, access to jobs, etc. So mobility justice is becoming a big part of um, the discussion in the United States. But no, I think, um, you know, I, I've, I've been reading a lot about Manchester or Manhattan um, and how, uh, you know, Manchester wants to, look, the bottom line is um, skylines. City skylines are really, really important to branding cities. And, you know, a lot of US cities have really quite sexy skylines. And I think Manchester wants that. Branding um, enrolling sustainability, as the city of Seattle did, to try and push on the, uh, the homeless people. A lot of city mayors, city growth machines, are realising sustainability sells. It sells in a different way in the US. I don't, I'm not so sure uh, in the UK it's as racialized, but everything is super racialized here. But the same processes are happening in, in, in the, the UK. You know, these great condo towers um, put more money into the, 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 the city coffers. Uh, and yet the mayors will say, oh, we want to stop gentrification. Do they really want to stop gentrification? When really what's happening is you are bringing in uh, new skills and talents, you're bringing in money to people, and you are moving out those people who are more of a draw on social safety networks, etc. But I, I take absolutely everything the, uh, the questioner said, except you know, my, my expansion of sustainability, my uh, conception of sustainability is much more broad than just simply green spaces. It is, you know, it is uh, absolutely about people, place, uh, coexistence, sharing notions. Yeah. And, you know, the gentrification of cities is the antithesis of the shared city in many ways. Just, you know, final point there. You know, I, I talked a little bit about gentrification. Again, that's a whole huge lecture in that. But I do remember David Harvey's quote at the AAG in Boston in, I think, 2017. He said, we're building cities for people to invest in, not to live in. It's such an important thing. That's why gentrification is happening. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's 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 a really ni nice way to, to end that observation. Couldn't agree more. Let me go to this, this, the second question. Here we go. How can the poor and marginalised in the city enact their political agencies so they can start co-producing better urban planning when the political and planning systems are not addressing income gaps effectively? Yeah, I mean, great question. Um, you know, I, <laughs> my students get, I'm sure, sick and tired of me uh, talking about, you know, the importance of leadership. But when I look around the world at good sustainability, good redistributive policies, then they're always happening in relation, it seems to me, to leadership that understands. This is why I'm excited about Boston. Look at Curitiba, Brazil in the 70s. You know, a lot of people say, oh, the bus rapid transit was all about greening the city. It wasn't. It was about social equity. It was about giving poorer people who use public transit predominantly access to Curitiba's services and, um, you know, places and spaces. Um, when we look at, I mentioned Belo Horizonte and the, uh, the food security strategy, the mayor in the early 90s um, came in and said, we're going to have a food security strategy built on social justice, food with dignity, and the Brazilian constitutional right to food. Ironically, Brazil has a constitutional right to food. We in the US have a constitutional right to bear arms. I mean, <laughs> go figure. Um, I, yeah, I mean, in terms of the question, um, the, the income gaps, what's, well, there's an actually a very interesting thing happening, and I don't know whether it's happening in the UK as well, but 
uh, here we're you know we're talking about the great resignation people are leaving their jobs workers are now managing to push up not as unions but as individuals you want me to come and work for you you want me to stay working for you pay me more money workers um, employers are so short of workers that workers are now driving up um, prices now this is a relatively new phenomenon how long it'll last i don't know uh, and, and i'm not particularly an economist but i think that uh, certainly mayors can set conditions, certainly here in the US where mayors have phenomenal powers, and you know that the states have much greater powers uh, over state issues than local or metropolitan regions in the, in the UK. So, you know, we're already looking on the transition team in Boston at how these income gaps can be narrowed, how that can be done quickly, um, and we're looking at uh, ways in which um, community organizations can have much greater input into planning. Let, let me just tell you, I mean, Boston has what's called the Boston Planning and Development Authority. We haven't separated out development and planning. They are absolutely um, areas that previous mayors have used for grand projects that really aggrandize their own sort of legacy. The incoming mayor is gonna look at completely reforming the um, uh, the, the Boston Planning and Development Agency and separating out planning and development. I often ask my students, in Boston, are we doing planning or development? We're doing development. We're not really doing planning. So I think there are policies, um, but yes, this, this income gap issue, I think is really important. And a little bit of progress is gonna be made in these post-COVID years as worker demand um, increases. Thanks. Thanks for that, Julian. So we've got a question here, another question. Um, in what ways does the term just sustainabilities challenge questions of just energy transitions in the global south? <laughs> um, well, um, let me ask, <laughs> let me put it back to the questioner. Um, I mean, you know, just sustainabilities is, you, you know, the concept is like a hundred foot above the ground concept, 35 meters or whatever. Um, and what I want people to do is use it in their own particular ways. So, you know, I don't actually do much work on just energy transition, but I'm all for the notion of just transition because it speaks absolutely to the, to the overall concept of just sustainability. So I'm not, an energy expert and certainly not an expert on the global south so i'm not exactly sure how that works but you know notions of just transition are absolutely central to notions of just sustainabilities and i mean one piece of work i did do um a while ago was when british columbia um i was in vancouver in 2011 and british columbia was uh, really at the forefront of sort of um you know uh, carbon policies and one of the uh, big issues was the idea of just transition because a lot of British Columbia's economy is based around uh, extractive resource based industries and a lot of the discussion was about you know how workers could be involved in designing this just transition from um, from extractive to more clean forms of um, forms of energy and resource use so yeah just transition is central absolutely central to the notion of just sustainability. I'm going to use chair's privilege, Julian, and just ask you a question, something that interests me um, when you were talking about just transitions, which is, um, I think you, you talked also a little bit uh, as you're going through your presentation about barriers and obstacles and challenges. And I wondered what you thought um, the role of trust and cohesion and the kind of public communication environment that we work with. Because one of the things I worry about, whether it's on climate change or sustainability or, or social justice, is, is how we convey um, the, the benefits of embracing just transitions and actually being bold and saying to, to communities, there are real costs to inaction. There are real costs to perpetuating this unfairness, this inequality. And yet we also live in these kind of public communication media environments that sometimes make it difficult to have these kinds of conversations and to talk reasonably about it without fake news um, and toxic media intervening. What's your, what's your thought about that? <laughs> 
you know, in our book sharing cities, Duncan McLaren and I really looked at these ideas of trust and um, and, and how sharing is both, um, you know, can enhance trust, but trust is necessary to enhance sharing as well. Um, you know, again, it, it, here in the US, I mean, we are, you know, this, to say we're in a culture war is an absolute understatement. We are just not talking to each other across this Democrat Republican divide. Um, you know, <clears throat> one of the, uh, I think, sadnesses of the infrastructure bill is now separated into two. But what the Democrats originally wanted was a bill that had both physical and social infrastructure. You know, I was explaining to my students, you know, what's the point of a new bridge across the River Charles in Boston if women are trapped in their homes because childcare is too expensive for them to re-enter the labour market? We had this with one of our uh, office workers at, at, at my university. She, um, you know, she had a kid, couldn't come back to work because what we were paying her for 20 hours a week was, was less than uh, what she would be paying for um, childcare. So I don't see how you can separate out physical and social infrastructures. And I'm, I'm kind of work, trying to work my way to, to, you, to your question. Um, it, but there's so much disinformation that the Republicans have put forward about this linkage of social and physical infrastructure that the people, people don't get it. Um, and I think you know the the misinformation, the mischievous inf uh, information givers are really um, winning here in the United States. And if we move to something, I mean, critical race theory, for instance, the reason why Virginia was lost uh, to the Democrats was because of the use of the phrase critical race theory. And I'm sure many of you have looked on YouTube and you've seen, you know, right wingers being uh, asked, "Well, what is critical race theory?" Well, I don't know, but I don't like it. <laughs> what it is, is understanding American history and why things are as they are, period. It's not some Marxist uh, sort of communist takeover. It's very simply looking at history uh, as it is, using the visual, quantitative, qualitative data and just really understanding. So totally misinformation, mischievous information is really, really, I think, problematic. And um, I don't know where it goes in the US, quite honestly, you know, moving off topic, I really don't know where it goes, but it is going to stymie clearly the Democrat agenda um, of Joe Biden. Uh, it's already being watered down. Um, but anyway, yeah, next question. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Julia. I, I, I agree. I think it's, it's a real challenge. And I don't, by the way, think the UK uh, um, is also immune to some of these things you've said as well. No, absolutely. Um, you know, let me let me move on to another question. I'm also conscious of time because I know you have another commitment and we promised we'd, we'd end in about five minutes or so, but we've got another question. Here we go. How do you differentiate between just sustainable urban planning as a buzzword in planning promises and actual just planning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, wow. That's, uh, actual just planning. Yeah. I'm not sure I fully understand um, the, the the concept, uh, the the question here, um, but I, I mean, you know, look, we have very different planning systems in the US compared to the UK. Some of the outcomes are similar, but the, the but the processes are very different. Um, I mean, for instance, you know, as I said earlier, um, in the US urban planning has been used as a spatial toolkit of white supremacy. I don't find evidence of that in UK planning. UK planning has disadvantaged uh, lower income people, but I don't find a specific racial lens in the UK. So here in the US, the um, issues of justice and equity are very much focused around racial equity and socioeconomic equity, because race and socioeconomic issues are virtually a proxy for each other here in the US. So um, we have, I think, some very, and I'm speaking now about the Boston metro area, we have some very um, well um, resourced and very vocal 
um, nonprofits. One example, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative in Boston. So Dudley Street is in the Roxbury Dorchester neighborhood, which was redlined. Um, <clears throat> and in the 1980s, it was, as I described, you know, like a like a bomb had been dropped, you know, disinvested because of redlining, no, um, you know, houses boarded up, you know, all of that kind of thing. A group formed called the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, but before they actually formed themselves, what they did was they did a, an analysis of the neighborhood and they constituted the board of directors of this organization to look like the neighborhood. And this is a really important point. If your organization doesn't look like the community it's serving, are you legitimate? Are you trusted? Are you even effective? Well, DSNI, 40 years on, now has uh, three community land trust farms. It has um, built like 800 affordable housing units. It's built maker spaces. It's built community spaces. It's built the Dudley Commons. It's created an urban village in many ways that has become, you know, celebrated by organizations like the Congress for New Urbanism. And this is in a low income minority neighborhood. And one of your questions a few, um, a few minutes back, you know, about what can low income people do? Well, this is what they can do. They are also the only nonprofit in the US to have been given eminent domain status by the city of Boston. And they have used that, you know, to build more community facilities. So I think community land trusts, um, community farms, community spaces. These are really, really important um, additions, I think, to adjust urban planning. And they are being replicated in other parts of the United States. So I think, you know, communities can do great things. And that really helps if you've got a mayor who's listening and who built her campaign on the support of these community level initiatives and has pledged resources for them. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I think I think that that really chimes with me as well. Um, Julia, I'm I'm conscious I'm conscious of the time, and I I think you you I know have another engagement to go to. So what I'm going to suggest is, if sure. if, if the audience will forgive me, um, we we draw it to a close now um, because you, you as I say you've been very generous with your time, and I have and I'm sure everybody else would say the same, really learned a huge amount from your lecture and, and really from the wisdom actually that came, came out of it in so many interesting ways. So please, please, please uh, accept my heartfelt thanks. And um, you can see me, I hope, uh, <laughs> clapping. Uh, uh, and I think also if you, if you just glance down at the chat as well, um, yeah. you will see many, many people expressing their thanks to you uh, really for a wonderful uh, uh, talk. So um, I think, uh, uh, you know, yes, the comments just keep on coming in terms of saying <laughs> thank you. Um, so again, I think I wish you well with, with your important work. I hope the AAG next year uh, delivers nicely in terms of uh, new uh, contributions to this really important topic of um, food justice. And uh, again, a heartfelt thanks. And thank you also to the audience for your engagement, your questions, and all the really wonderful observations as well therein. So Great. thanks again, Julian. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.